In your book, you talk about love as if it were a business deal of some kind. Isn't the essence of love that it is above, uh, above self-interest? In love, the currency is virtue. You love people, not for what you do to, for them or what they do for you. You love them for the values, the virtues, which they have achieved in their own character. You don't love causelessly. You don't love everybody indiscriminately. You love only and then, those who deserve it. And then if a man is weak or a woman is weak, then she is beyond, he is beyond love? He certainly does not deserve it. She was attempting to portray it, to portray the, the, the an affair between them as totally rationally justified. Uh, she said it was nobody's business and we were sworn to absolute secrecy, but she said since they were such unusual people, it was inevitable that they feel what they felt, that there could be no objection to an affair. I also felt I was very aware of how little Ayn Rand had had in her life from the outside, from other people. And I thought, okay, if I could press a button and make Ayn romantically happy, would I do it? And I thought, yes, I would. That's altruism. I know. I know. It was. <laughs> I'm not proud of saying yes, but I said yes. I know, it's half. <laughs> well, this is the second floor. And this is one of my favorite parts of the house. Boy, Susan, this is a, this a beautiful yeah. uh, central corridor up here. It must and be a bear keeping this carpet clean, you know, huh? Well, the, the maintenance of the boats go by. You can spend the night beside her. And you know that she's half crazy. But that's why you want to be there. And she feeds you tea and oranges that come all the way from China. And just when you mean to tell her that you have no love to give her, then she gets you on her wavelength. And she lets the river answer that you've always been her lover. to travel with her and you want to travel blind and you know she will trust you for you've touched her perfect body with your mind first time i ever looked into his eyes i saw somebody totally different than i had expected to see and that's the person i fell in love with and you want to travel with him and you want to travel blind And you think maybe you'll trust him For he's touched your perfect body with his mind By 1997, the American boom was reshaping the whole world. Economists and bankers who saw the world as one giant economic system now dominated the American government. They believed that the way to achieve global economic stability was for nations to open themselves up to the free flow of capital. And the laboratory that they had created for this experiment was Southeast Asia. <laughs> Under American pressure, countries like South Korea and Thailand had given up all restrictions and Western capital flooded in. It helped fuel what was called the Asian miracle. But a group within the White House were worried that much of the Western money was going to fund a giant speculative bubble in property. And when the boom collapsed, the money would flee, leaving the countries like Thailand and South Korea decimated. The group were led by the economist Joseph Stiglitz. The Council of Economic Advisers was very worried about these short-term speculative capital flows because while the countries benefit a little bit when the money comes in, 
when the money goes out, the countries are devastated. So it was not in the interest of Korea, and it was not in the interest of the United States. It was in the interest of a very small group of, 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 of people who make their money from these speculative, these short-term capital flows, bankers and hedge funds. It was a really very small group in whose interest it was. The Council of Economic Advisers decided to warn the president. They wanted to persuade him to stop some of the more excessive short-term speculation in the Asian countries. But they came face to face with the Secretary of the Treasury, Robert Rubin. Rubin had previously run Goldman Sachs, and under his leadership, the bank had created many of the computer models that underpinned the boom. Rubin had a revolutionary vision of a world system completely open to the free flow of capital. Joseph Stiglitz, who headed the Council of Economic Advisers, was convinced that the Treasury was stopping the warnings reaching the President. He believed that Rubin and the Treasury had effectively become agents of the financial world, embedded in the heart of government. Treasury had close connections with the financial markets. The Secretary of Treasury had come from the largest investment bank and went afterwards into the largest commercial bank. And these are the people with whom U.S. Treasury naturally interacts. And to Wall Street, we were threatening a bursting of the bubble. To Wall Street, we were threatening their profits. So the Treasury worked extremely hard to make sure the President never got to consider the issues, making sure that the perspectives of the Council of Economic Advisers... Which was you. ...never reached the President. So they kept your arguments from the President? Effectively, yes. <laughs> What some people were beginning to see was that the computer networks and the global systems that they had created hadn't distributed power. They had just shifted it, and if anything, concentrated it in new forms. And some of the computer utopians from Silicon Valley were also beginning to realize that the World Wide Web was not a new kind of democracy, but something far more complicated where power was exercised over the individual in new and surprising ways. Carmen Hermosillo had been one of the earliest believers in the new communities of cyberspace. Her online name was Humdog, and she lived on the West Coast. But then she lost faith, and she posted an attack which caused a sensation online. It is fashionable to suggest, she wrote, that cyberspace is some island of the blessed, where people are free to indulge and express their individuality. This is not true. I have seen many people spill out their emotions, their guts online. And I did so myself, until I began to see that I had commodified myself. Commodification means that you turn something into a product which has a money value. In the 19th century, commodities were made in factories by workers who were mostly exploited. But I created my interior thoughts as commodities for the corporations that owned the board that I was posting to, like CompuServe or AOL. And that commodity was then sold on to other consumer entities as entertainment. Cyberspace, she wrote, is a black hole. It absorbs energy and personality and then represents it as an emotional spectacle. It is done by businesses that commodify human interaction and emotion. And we are getting lost in the spectacle. She wore blue velvet Bluer than velvet was the night In 1997, Bill Clinton made it clear to Monica Lewinsky that their love affair was over. Hurt and bewildered, Lewinsky poured out her feelings to her colleague Linda Tripp, 
who had become her friend. But in September of that year, Linda Tripp secretly began to record their phone conversations. At the very same time, on the other side of the world, the property bubble in Southeast Asia finally burst. Two enormous crises were about to engulf the world. One would strip the last remnants of power from Bill Clinton. The other would bring the global economic system to its knees. The dream of a stable world was about to be assaulted by the two uncontrollable forces of love and power. The Asian crisis began in Thailand. Hundreds of thousands of offices and apartments had been built, but no one wanted them. As the developers went bust and defaulted on their loans, Western investors panicked and rushed to take their money out of the country. The panic began to spread, first to South Korea. Housewives queued to give their spare dollars to the government to rescue the country. But it wasn't enough. Teams from the IMF flew in and they offered billions of dollars in loans to stabilize the country's economies. But there was a price. The IMF said that the reason the crisis had happened was because the Asian economies weren't Western enough. In return for the loans, they would have to turn themselves into models of the free market. This meant cutting government spending and getting rid of corruption and nepotism in the ruling elites. Then the crisis got worse. It spread to Indonesia. Indonesia was ruled by President Suharto. He was an autocrat surrounded by a corrupt clique of advisors and family members. He refused to do what the IMF wanted. So the IMF turned to the US Secretary of the Treasury, Robert Rubin. Well, our objective was not to reform the country for the sake of reform. Our problem, the problem that the international community faced was that both the, the, the international markets and the domestic holders of capital were very quickly losing confidence in the Indonesian regime. And by that time, it was our view that if President Suharto was going to reestablish confidence, he had to deal seriously with corruption. And that was something that he simply was unwilling to do. Robert Rubin and the U.S. Treasury were determined to force Suharto to their will. In an atmosphere of growing panic in Washington, Rubin's team began to argue that the overthrow of Suharto might be the only way to solve the crisis. President Clinton was now increasingly enmeshed in the crisis over Monica Lewinsky, and enormous political power was passing to Rubin and his Treasury team. They, and not the State Department, were now running America's foreign policy. And everything was judged by whether it was a threat to the global economic system. There's, there is no question that the Treasury Secretary, in this case me, <laughs> got involved in, in sets of issues that went, went way beyond what Treasury Secretaries ordinarily got involved in. But the reason was that there was real risk that if Indonesia had chaos, political chaos I'm talking about, that could spread threatening in the interest of the global economy.